Hello everyone, welcome. Um, I'm James Harding, editor and co-founder of Tortoise. Um, Tuesdays, as you know, are our um, open news meetings. And so forgive me if there's a little less razzmatazz and a bit more um, put your shoulder to the wheel because the things that are on our minds this week in Tortoise are all quite chewy. They are about what are our long-term commissions so what stories should we be choosing to commission now for September through to the end of the year? There's a big debate that I'd like to engage in about how we do opinions. There's so much, you know, if you like cheap and cheerful, not that cheap, in fact, free, and not necessarily that cheerful, rather shouty, opinion out there in the world of news. How do you do deep, I'd like to think intelligent and, if you like, considered, i.e. all sides of the argument, takes on some of the big issues uh, that we face. And then there's an odd thing I wanted to talk about, which is, feels live in the newsroom, is how do we get the balance right between... It's not spinach and cheesecake. It's not good for you and fun for you. It's actually the mix of things that we love and the mix of things that we think about the sort of head and heart and my measure for that is that I fear that if I'd been a journalist in the 60s I would have spent my life writing about Harold Wilson's government and 30 years later all that anyone wanted to talk about was the Beatles and if you like you missed the only story that matters so those are the sort of three big things uh, on our mind long-term commissions um, the the kind of if you like culture politics uh, mix and tortoise takes the opinions i've got a couple in particular on each of those that i'd like to discuss with people but if you've not been to one of our open news meetings the tuesday lunchtime meetings before you'll know that this is genuinely like walking into the newsroom on a pretty sunny Tuesday uh, lunchtime. Walk in and you'd be greeted with the question, which is, hi, what have you got? Story-wise, what is on your mind? What do you think we should be touching upon? Now, uh, the great uh, James Wilson, whom you may not have met before, um, but is hosting the chat and is the person, there he is, hello James, thank you for doing this. Um, uh, is the person who's going to sort of nudge you and prod you and corral you and try and drive some order out of this. Uh, if you've been in a news meeting, you know that they're not particularly uh, structured, but they do, I hope, deliver something that's meaningful at the end, which is a set of ideas and arguments. So James will be there um, at that, and I hope that um, there, 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 there'll be some good thoughts to come out of it. I just wanted to pick up, if you're new to it, on how this thing works in practical terms. So last week, we put into our open news list a set of stories that we thought were worth looking at, and we discussed on Tuesday at lunchtime. Right? And if we can just toot our horn for a moment, the, the first subject we touched upon was the prospects that, although people weren't saying it publicly, in private, what we were hearing from AstraZeneca, from people at the Department of Health, was that the prospects on vaccines were much better than we were being told. And that rather than it necessarily being an 18 to 24 month process, you could begin to see some real progress by the end of the year. And as you will have seen, if you looked at the papers today, the last 48 hours worth of news, people are really encouraged. Now, there's a whole set of questions that rise, arises from that, prices, distribution, testing, but that was the one thing that we flagged up. A second subject that we discussed last week was our plans for this week's Tortoise file. If you've had a chance to look in the Tortoise app and or you've gone onto our website, you'll see the thing that we've really focused on this week are the disappeared, those people who've been silenced in China. And the reason for this is that we held one of these open news meetings before lockdown and Ken Roth, the head of Human Rights Watch globally, came into our newsroom and said, the story that you need to be looking at is the, the, the government and the approach of President Xi Jinping. If you want to know the Human Rights Watch, the human rights story in the world today, it's China. 
Now, we had commissioned by a guy called Harold Mas a really deep look at what was happening in Xinjiang over a year ago. So again, if you go to the Tortoise website, you'll see a, a good while ago that, that Harold Mas's piece on what was happening in Xinjiang reported it out in some depth. This week, what we're trying to do is take a few different aspects of the, the being silenced in China. So yesterday and today, you'll have seen we've really looked at the citizen journalists and activists who set out to talk about the pan pandemic, try and review what was really happening in Wuhan and elsewhere in China, and who were then detained without trial. And if you can see their stories, you will see a pattern which raises big questions about the apparatus of Xi Jinping, but also raises deeper ones about what we can really trust and know in terms of China and the pandemic. Then the rest of the week, we're going to come and look at two really young people. I think they're called Chen Mei and Tsai Wei, 27 year old, I think late 20s, uh, Chinese citizens based in Beijing, trying to do something really rather extraordinary, working in an outfit called Terminus 2049. The Chinese revolution happened in 1949. So 2049 is a reference to the century of Chinese communist rule, Terminus 2049. And what they're trying to do is restore information that's been deleted from the internet. So what they're looking at is to say, actually the censors in China are not gonna have their way we are, if you like, digital archivists of today. And then finally, uh, a man called Min Xin Pei, who is probably, I think, the best Chinese thinker about politics and the US-China relationship, is going to do an analysis for us at the end of the week, looking at um, the impact, what's happening in the US-China relationship and the preconditions that we're being set for uh, a, a Cold War. Uh, and I know that's not a thing that you say lightly, but it is a thing that Min Xin Pei articulates at some, at some length. And one other thing, sorry, I missed one piece of this whole China puzzle that we discussed, which is we, in Giles Wittell's reporting, Giles reported yesterday, the one thing that he also set out to do was try and say, well, who do we find responsible? Beyond Xi Jinping, who do we find responsible? And in, and in this case, we're going to point the finger at one man called Chen Chen Guo, Chen Chen Guo, who is the governor of Xinjiang, the person who has built these detention camps or quote unquote re-education camps that house perhaps more than a million Uyghur Muslims in the northwest of China. So I, I give you all of that because I just want you to know that if you come along on these Tuesday lunchtimes, you think, what is everyone warbling on about? It seems so disjointed. Actually, you can come along and be part of a conversation with Ken Roth that helps deliver a week of uh, journalism. You can come along, engage in a conversation about vaccines that actually inform the sense makers that we did, the debates through the course of next week, that then make you feel as though you've got to jump on what happens uh, this week. And we actually got a line last week in one of the conversations, which was about looking at external outside UK testing and the internationalization of these vaccines. We were pointed towards Cuba, which we're following up and, uh, and looking at now. Anyway, that is a really, even by my own standards, long and wordy introduction uh, to today's open uh, news meeting. Um, I'd love to start hearing from people on uh, what you think uh, we, um, we should be talking about. Uh, I can see uh, that there is a, a um, absolutely uh, uh, fantastic range of subjects around. I'm gonna come first to Uma Hassan, if I might. Uma, just because this is gonna be the sort of dad dancing moment of the hour where you and I engage in a conversation around uh, a PlayStation 4 game. Um, I'm engaged in a very meaningful argument with my son about why he shouldn't have Fortnite. So I'm on the wrong side of this argument, Uma. So you should help me through understanding uh, what The Last of Us 2 is about and why I should care about it. So um, thank you very much, James. So I think what it is, it's sort of related to, I think this was an article that was covered a couple of months ago. Um, this is relating to the, develop, to the developer Naughty Dog, who developed The Last of Us, and they're a first party studio for Sony Compute Interactive Entertainment. And yeah. um, what sort of happened is the writer of The Last of Us, who is actually the vice president for the studio, um, um, Neil Druckmann, he's 
apparently um apparently after the release of uncharted 4 4 years ago apparently 70% of their staff who developed the game had left the company and they they were forced to sign ndas because because a lot of the team behind the, the game were ve were not very happy with how um, they were treated in terms of the crunch culture so what that means is hold on slowly um, go slowly with me here sorry what is the crunch culture so crunch culture means when you when you're at the end of a phase of developing a game a team has to work very long hours to 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 get that game on time because they have to hit certain deadlines before it's released to the world on that particular platform right okay good all right i'm and so i'm only i'm listening because also andrew girdwood's helping me out here as you uh, speak is ex explaining exactly this okay so keep going i'm sort of interrupted so what it is is it's sort of what are the issues um, and i think there's been a lot of backlash around this game purely because a lot of people when the game came out um what happened was there was a huge backlash because of this because of the main protagonist um who's a lady um a girl called ellie who apparently turns out to be lesbian and i think everybody just seems to be up in arms around it right because gaming has not had the best of times in terms of this culture and it all sort of goes back to Gamergate back in 2014. Yes. So, so there's just there's so many different variables and I think it's just sort of leading to all sorts of Twitter pylons and I think the creator of the game is being harangued with abuse on social media about the story. Uh, Umar, listen, I am I'm caught between two colleagues at work, just so you know, who are always saying to me, this is sort of the cultural phenomenon that we should be doing, and no one does it uh, properly. And I think back to the, the kind of the great move The Guardian made a generation ago, which was to take celebrities seriously. And one thing I definitely want to do is make sure we take digital culture seriously. And the person I go to in this, when we get in this mess, because obviously you can see, I don't know what I'm talking about, is Pete Hoskin. Pete, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Can can you hear me? I can. So, Pete, what do you um? So, so what do you, what should we be doing on this? So, I I think saying that I take digital culture very seriously is a is a polite way of saying that I do a, a lot of gaming. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's a very uh, it's a very posh way of saying Pete's a gamer. Yeah. Um, I think to be honest, I think Umar has, has summed up the situation very well. Um, there are two things going on. I think with The Last of Us 2 that are representative of where gaming culture is at and by extension where a lot of the culture is at. And that is um, firstly that games are now the cultural battleground. They're, they're where often where the culture wars are fought. So um, I mean Umar has already mentioned Gamergate but this goes back to several years and it, it started it was a, a very niche sort of story about a a, a, a female journalist and games reviews and games developers sort of working in hock with each other but basically some very nasty characters online got very angry about this and used it as the basis for forming arguments about um women and sort of ethnic minorities and people like that getting involved in games and they, they saw it very much as a sort of male only space and they've they've resisted basically the diversification of games and out of this sort of internet subculture this angry gaming community in a way you can trace it to the alt-right and, and you can trace it to many things today actually it's it's interesting last week's twitter hack was conducted through um partially conducted through discord which is yes. a um online chat forum effectively but that was built by and for gamers yes. um, you know, so, so there are all these weird gaming communities that are actually changing the world in good and often in very bad ways every single day. Um, I think the other thing with The Last of Us 2, it's a separate thing in a way, is uh, yeah, this issue of crunch culture. And I also mentioned in the chat, there's another company called CD Projekt Red. Um, I mean, the, the truth is I think every major games developer um, is is guilty of this really 
it's, 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 I mean, some might say it's just part of making a game, is that basically there's so much to do. Games are so big and so complicated nowadays. That, I mean, CD Projekt Red, they, they made a game called The Witcher 3, which may well be my favourite game of all time. But this is a game you spend hundreds of hours in. Your character can walk for miles and miles and miles, get involved in many, many stories. There's just a lot in it. Um, and what's happening increasingly is that these massive cultural projects, these artistic projects, come up against uh, deadlines. They come up against fan pressure. And, um, you know, no one likes to say, uh, you know, this game's going to take five years or it'll be ready when we've done it. They don't actually take a very tortoise approach to game development. So, and, and, and so then, Pete, so what's the story, do you think? I think, I think the story, there are, I mean, there are two separate stories for the two separate strands. The, one is the sort of the culture wars element of gaming. So much of modern culture is born in that crucible. The crunch element is, I think in a way we're seeing, it's almost like the end of the 19th century, the early 20th century, in that we're seeing um, a labour movement around games now. Um, okay. So the, there is an exploitation going on. Crunch is what happens when game programmers, they have to stay up. I mean, I think the best writer on this is a guy called Jason Schreer. Uh, and he used to write for a gaming website called Kotaku. Uh, and he has recently been hired, and I think this is interesting in itself, he's been hired by Bloomberg to cover, ga cover games, which would not have happened even a year ago. Um, and uh, he wrote a very good article last year about a game called Anthem. Um, and I think it's probably the best article. I mean, I can post the link now. Um, oh, sorry, just posting it in the chat. Um, it's, it's one of the best articles on the, the effects that crunch has on people. Um, and, you know, it's sort of like serious cases of depression, people leaving work, just all sorts of horrible things going on. Uh, and, and what you're finding now is that games makers are, are unionising, they're organising, they're getting together and saying that this has to stop. Um, and like I say, it, it's, it's almost like the early 20th century, but it's happening in a very modern way. So I think that's the story. And, and then just to tell me one thing, Pete, or Yasmin, if you want to come in, do. But is the, the, the thing that Yasmin is saying in the, that Yasmin Abdul Majid is saying in the, in the chat is, is about, look, have games ever been exactly feminist? Have they really, you know, um, just sort of how male and chauvinist, and I don't know about the games world, is that itself a stereotype of the gaming world, or is it true? Um, I think so. I know Professor Lucy did and uh, somebody else, Andrew, in the chat mentioned that there definitely have been kind of subcultures within the gaming world um, that are kind of like counter culture to the mainstream gaming world. Right. So there are sort of there have been serious girl gamers and um, independent sort of cultures. But I would say in, in kind of my experience, um, part of the the DNA of that world is that it is broadly counter culture. Um, it is broadly sort of pushing the boundaries. I think if you look at the gamers that are big on um, Twitch or YouTube, although there are one or two exceptions, generally they tend to be people that oh, the, the overwhelming kind of sentiment is that we don't like to play by the rules. Um, we are a bit, we are kind of perhaps haven't been accepted um, by the mainstream. And so we'll create our own culture here and we don't like to be told um, how we should or shouldn't be. And so, yes, we'll use the N-word or yes, we'll, um, we'll sort of... And I think there's a challenge because there's a lot of different things getting mixed up. You've, you have folks that are kind of maybe um, descended from like the cyberpunks back in the day um, and, they, you know, and that's kind of evolved into a world that's um, a bit more in the crypto space. Uh, you've got folks that are um, into the, the sort of the massive multi online player games um, like World of Warcraft and so on. So I think part of the challenge is, so th there's a lot going on. Part of the challenge is there are lots of different cultures. Um, and so to generalize is perhaps a bit unfair, but I would say overwhelmingly um, they are male, overwhelmingly they are um, white. Um, and overwhelmingly, they do not like to be challenged um, and they do not like to be told that there is a right way to do things. And or, or what is right is not necessarily kind of what is deemed right and moral um, in the kind of in, in, in a broader sense. So 
I mean, and that might be unfair and I'm definitely happy to be challenged, but certainly as somebody who grew up, you know, being surrounded by gamers, um, yeah. I was a terrible gamer, so I wasn't very good at it. Uh, that was that was something that I that I learned very early on. Okay, well, I, I'm going to bring in, yes, thanks. I'm going to bring in, if I might, um, Jack Graham and Girdwood. Jack, are you there? Hi, uh, yeah. Um, of course, well, I'm not in the industry myself, but have been gaming for... Oh, uh, he's on mute. Nine. No, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Can hear you fine okay. Jack. Yeah. yeah um, well, I think uh, it's very true what uh, Yasmin was saying, and I think there are a number of different elements to this. If you think about the consumer side, you only have to log on to some Call of Duty for a few games just to see the types of comments that can be said. But I th so it's no real secret that there can be a lot of abuse and terrible things being said online, but. I think it, it does go deeper than that, as has been uh, mentioned already. If we think about it from a corporate point of view, there is a lot of uh, reported consumer bias in some of these countries. Whilst they may, these companies may be creating really expansive universes with their uh, strong female leads, for example, or with their uh, different ethnicity characters, all you have to do is look at some of the practices regarding their crunch time, for example, and you realize that it's, they're not exactly practicing what they preach, for example, with. And Jack, can I just ask you, because obviously, I mean, I've worked in an industry my whole life, which has a sort of daily crunch time or weekly, depending on the kind of media outlet you're working in. Mm. I don't say it with pride, I say it just with a kind of shrug of reality. You know, if you work in a newspaper, there's a lot of faffing around in the morning and in the, the closer you get to deadline, the, the harder and the more stressful things become. Is there something happening in the gaming industry that is different from other creative industries? Is there a crunch culture that's specific to gaming? Uh, from a newsroom point of view, I would say that it is slightly different as well because it's been quite different when it comes to COVID-19. We have seen a lot of project delayed, but that seems to be completely abnormal. Normally these things ship come hell or high water. So it's slightly different in a newsroom in that you are going to be doing these 10 hours days as standard from what I'm aware. So uh, to me, that's why it's quite good to see, uh, I, I think it's been mentioned in the comments, there's now this uh, booming indie uh, style game system coming up. So you get smaller and smaller developers because right now I think people just are realizing that there's only so long you can rely on the workers uh, just applying to their goodwill because right. you know, you've got lots of tech students applying just expecting this is their dream. They can't wait to get out and make it big. Right. Then reality bites and they, suddenly they're working nonstop for months at a time. I, I, I'm enjoying the comment. The reason I'm smiling, Jack, is there's a comment from um, from Andrew Brown, who, like me, is a, grew up on newspapers. And as he points out, um, we have deadlines once a day, a week or a month, not once every three years, with billions riding on the result. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I can play that. That's Very well put. <laughs> but, but, so I'm interested, I'm interested in both of those elements. I mean, obviously, we didn't expect to get into this conversation today, but crunch culture and the culture wars. I'm just going to, if I might, bring in Andrew Girdwood too. Uh, Andrew, what's your thinking on this? Yeah, it's a, fan it's a fantastic subject. I have no friends who are still game journalists. They've all left because of the toxicity in the community. So treat carefully. Um, I think the gaming industry is all, I mean, as we talked about, it's, a, it's, billion, it's bigger than movies. And you have this really perverse relationship where the developers and the publishers and the distributors are not the same, not the same people. And for the bottom end of the chain, the people doing the work to actually even qualify for payments, they need to hit certain goals, such as distribution deadlines. And that's why you have this extra layer on the crunch culture. Right. An interesting story might be Bungie, who have been developing a game called Destiny, who uh, tied themselves in with Activision. They've recently bought themselves out of that relationship, so they no longer have those same corporate overloads. And as a result, the game is better. They've taken out some of the money-making elements known as loot crates, which I think many governments now just rule as that's gambling for kids. That's, that's gone. And that's, it's, it is a nice story. Um, slightly related. A loot crate, just, just, sorry, Andrew. What's a loot crate? A loot crate is a horrible mechanic where in the game, 
you can buy a mystery object for, for real money. And when, it's, when the mystery is revealed to you, it might be a trivial piece of decoration or it might be a, a game-changing element like a, a big gun or a tank or something. So effectively, teenagers or kids were spending 50p a pound here and there, but dozens of times a day in order to get another randomized element. It's essentially a sort of a, a casino. Okay. And just, and, and, and Andrew, just one final thing on this. What, what do you make of the um, point that Yasmin was making, and I suppose Uma was making at the top, which is this, the, the intersection between crunch culture and culture wars, as Pete described it, that actually some of these issues that are about working conditions are playing out in terms of, you know, creative priorities and, uh, and expression. Yeah, uh, the, the games companies have a, an interest in this. I, I can't think of any industry who is spending more money and more resources to take toxicity out of the communities that they build because a toxic community is not one that gamers re return to. Right. Having said that, I agree with Yasmin that the, it is a, you have a gatekeeping element. If you're not misfit enough, you might not even be allowed into the community. So I can see why it's a nightmare for the right. games companies. They need okay. to be all things to all people. Well, well, can I do, I, I see, by the way, as you were talking, Andrew, Pete was saying that the regulation of loot crates is, is recommended yeah. by this House of Lords report, um, which I also see William Jeremy kindly pointed out. But can I ask one, one favour? Anyone who really knows what they're talking about, so I kind of can happily count myself out here, do message Pete Hoskin in the chat, because we'll obviously come back to this. There's something here, and it's the kind of subject that touches millions and millions of people's lives and uh, and many of us in the as for reasons you can see in the mainstream media will often uh, miss I, I would love to go back to something that i think daniel dipper mentioned really early on i think it might have been you daniel which was the russia report and my colleague and fellow editor giles would tell us here so i'd love to come to giles about it uh in a moment um I don't know, Daniel, before I come to Charles, I'm just going to check in with Daniel. It was you who wanted to raise it, wasn't it? Are you there? Yes, it was, yep. I, I did raise the Russia report, yep. Okay, lovely. Um, do you have anything specific on it, or should, should I go to Charles to try and... Um, well, I mean, I, I watched a little bit of the coverage this morning because they did a um, kind of like a, a press meeting with um, some of the main people from the committee. I mean, the most important things I kind of took from it was they were saying about how they couldn't really find evidence of such a Russian interference in the Brexit referendum because it hadn't been investigated by the government. So I thought that was quite interesting and that was quite sort of a, a damning verdict they gave there. It was going as far back as the Scottish referendum. I, I kind of the first I'd thought of knew about it was the search about Brexit, but actually went back further than that. And they kind of ignored the warning signs. And I mean, you know, at the time there was a lot of sort of not pro-Russia events, but there was kind of this idea of Britain trying to be open to all countries across the world. So I think we've kind of seen that sort of backfire now. Well, Daniel, thank you. Charles, what do you make of this? Well, I think it answers the and question. Was, you were in, what, what years were you in Russia? A uh, while back, uh, 1999 to uh, 2001, and then sort of fairly regular trips back since. But I, I cannot claim to have been at the Moscow end of the meddling, much as it would have been fascinating to be so. Um, Thank you, Yeah. First of all, I would refer everybody to what Edward Lucas told us, uh, when was it? On Friday, at the Friday, Sense Make yeah. Alive Thinking. There is a public and there is a private, uh, uh, a classified version of this report. So we don't know the half of it. And it's very likely that um, the closest thing to a smoking gun is, is there redacted. But I think from, from what we've uh, seen of it, it, as a, it, it answers the question, uh, was, why was the government sitting on it? It's because it is accused of actively avoiding uh, a proper uh, systematic investigation of, a, of the allegations of Russian meddling in UK politics. It was playing catch up um, in uh, 2014 at the time of the Scottish referendum. It recommends immediate action be taken. The government's al already rejected that call for immediate action. 
saying there's no evidence. And as Daniel was intimating just now, uh, of course there's no evidence if you haven't looked for it properly. Um, uh, and no one is pretending that it's an easy search to um, identify, given that almost all of this is, is via uh, social media platforms, to identify the players, to uh, uh, um, I'd, I'd identify their relationships, to, to describe accurately their relationships with Russian state organs, even though that has been done pretty uh, successfully on the American side, which is why I found myself walking uh, across the river in St. Petersburg to the actual address where the main troll factory was initially located and then walking from there to the next address where it was located and then being told uh, uh, that, that it had since um, diasporized as it were across St. Petersburg uh, there's been no UK equivalent of that kind of forensic investigation that uh, was conducted by um, US intelligence agencies, all 16 of them. Uh, and let's, let's face it, um, um, some pretty well-resourced American media organisations after the 2016 election. Um, uh, will, will the Johnson government be able to continue to reject um, the call in this report for a full assessment of Let's, let's put aside the Scottish referendum in 2014 and talk about the, the uh, 2016, um, when of course we had the, the Brexit referendum. Um, I don't know. I hope not. Uh, Dominic Grieve has already come out and said he's, he's downright angry. Um, we got a sense actually last week that he was angry. I mean, he's been very grieve about this, hasn't he? Uh, and and um, uh, managing to sublimate anger and, and stay quiet since he left Parliament. But um, my colleague Ellie Jacobs tried to invite him to join us for the, for the thinking on, on Friday and um, uh, got a, a fairly shirty telephone call in reply saying, no, I can't, obviously I can't comment on this until it's released. But one sensed that, that there was simmering anger there. Mm. Um, and, and we've had confirmation of that today. And, and John, um, just, just can I just ask you two things about it, just practically speaking. If we're trying to think, you know, we, we, we did early on a really big piece by you, MH17, then as you said, a big piece that was on sort of Putin at 20 years. Uh, there's, a, there's a line from last week's thinking that's been ringing in my ears, which was David Frum talking about power and how people in power don't necessarily persecute the innocent, that's quite a difficult thing to do, but they can protect the guilty. And I just wonder whether or not there's anything in this report that you feel like, okay, well, th there's stuff here left on the cutting room floor. There's a way of actually approaching this story-wise. That means we could get into Russian influence because it feels as though we've got tidbits between Bill Browder, you know, Salisbury, now Scotland, unclear on Brexit. But I don't know what the thread is. I don't know where the story is. I don't know whether you can see it. Not, I'll be honest, I can't, I can't see it yet. What, yeah. what, what would be really revealing though, I think is a forensic comparison between what appears in, in the public version of the report and what we can establish was offered to the committee by the people who gave evidence. Bill Browder was one, Edward Lucas was another. We know Chris Steele was a third, um, all to a greater or lesser extent willing to discuss the, what, what evidence they gave to the, to the committee. Um, uh, I know that there are people at the Open Russia Foundation who, fe who, who feel that the committee went off in the wrong direction um, when it came to following the money uh, coming from Russia into the Tory party. Right. Um, Why? Uh, they have an ax to grind there. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I've, I think the cutting room floor will, will, will be a good place to look. Um, and, and I think in Julian Lewis, at least in, in Edward Lucas's assessment, you would have a, um, a point of contact uh, willing to discuss um, whether he thinks that, that uh, the committee has, um, has has even got even close to, to the real story. I mean, he made a huge 
took a huge political, personal political risk to, to install himself where he is now. And one can assume that he has his reasons for that. Well, I, I tell you what, I'd like to bring in Megan Kenyon, because one of the things that's touched upon that we do see, I mean, it's, it's strange that the Brexit referendum seems to be underreported, but the Scottish referendum heavily reported. But there is a sort of live question about Scotland and the Union, Northern Ireland, Wales, too, about the different responses to the pandemic. And Megan, I assume you were touching upon that. Hello. I assume you were touching Hi. upon that rather than the Russia report. You were talking about the point that Andrew Gerd was making, too, about the, the sort of different politics different sense of where the economy and society is going is that what's on your mind yeah so i just think that um in terms of reporting on the union obviously there's quite a lot on scotland because they seem to shout the loudest really but i think especially um after brexit and um the way that northern ireland was treated sort of during the negotiations i think it really showed up um so sort that of the lack i want to say like the lack of respect from sort of central government for Northern Ireland. I mean, I think it was particularly shown with the sacking of Julian Smith, who had really helped to um, reinstate the power sharing agreement at Stormont. And I think that obviously with the pandemic, what's really been exposed is, so Stormont came back in, in early January, they reinstated um, the power sharing agreement and the pandemic hit in March and they've had such a good response to it. They had the um, track and trace up uh, a few weeks earlier than, you know, England did. Um, and I just think that while there's lots of reporting on Scotland because obviously they've had a referendum and Nicola Sturgeon is doing incredibly well in comparison to Boris Johnson, I do think that occasionally Northern Ireland gets left behind in terms of reporting on the union. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something I'd like to see more of especially with Brexit and with the border being drawn across the Irish Sea, mm. um, which obviously is so, well, in my opinion, is pretty serious. Um, so, yeah, that's I mean, kind of what I was getting at. I mean, you're completely right, Megan, and I see Nico McDonnell making this point too about the treatment of Northern Ireland and the media. Just to give you one sense of it and how what you say is true, but a structural explanation for it. When I, when I remember arriving at the BBC and thinking about plans for the debates, the uh, debates ahead of elections, and one of the things that arises is how you handle Northern Ireland almost immediately, because the, party, the mix of parties in Wales, England and Scotland is different from the mix of parties in Northern Ireland. And so you can't run the same debates and the same, even the same format in Northern Ireland. But the result is, you know, I, I, um, actually a friend of mine said to me, the result is that you'll often find political journalists in the UK, in, in London, sorry, who know more about New Hampshire and Iowa than they do about the politics of, uh, of Northern Ireland. So uh, actually Chris Cook actually often makes that point. Um, I, I'm just, Nico McDonald, you're trying to make a similar point too, aren't you, about just the framing of Northern Ireland, when we learn about it and what we learn. Do, do you want to just, when and make that say what you mean uh, yeah i just i mean i was involved in uh anti-imperialist politics want of a better term around ireland northern ireland in the 80s and 90s and uh, was involved in arguing that what was not wasn't a conflict that was religious in its foundation but between people who were discriminated against in terms of their civil rights and liberties who happen to be Catholic or nationalist and ultimately the British state although of course the you know from the settlement in the Elizabethan era onwards um, you know the Protestants in Northern Ireland had tended to be uh, you know side with the British state although Wolf Tone was an exception for instance um, and you know obviously this was a pretty controversial argument at the time but I think the way in which Northern Irish politics was characterized as being uh, religious rather than, you know, a civil rights conflict, very much inspired by the civil rights movement in the United States, which we're thinking about now in terms of Black Lives Matter. Um, and, it, you know, I found, to be honest, the BBCs and other broadcasters referring to the troubles as, I mean, deeply ironic. I mean, the troubles, it sounds like, you know, you know, two people having an argument rather than a, you know, bloody conflict. So I'd be interested to see if 
uh, you know, now really? we're revising history, if we start revising the way we talk about this as a civil war, not as a, you know, just are honest about it, to be honest. That's, Nick, that's really, really interesting. So I, I suspect you're right, there is going to be a revisiting that. It's a really good thing to look at. We should we'll think about. I'm going to, I'm going to if I might, um, bring in a few other people who've got uh, hands up and made um, uh, contribution. Tess, my, Murray, my colleague Tess is uh, here. With me. Hello, Tess, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, James. How are you? Um, just, I actually, sorry, I just wanted to backtrack slightly to, G to Giles's, you know, where's the thread through the Russian story. Mm -hmm. And I was just really interested in the kind of bit of process that I don't know anything about. When I was listening to Bill Browder on Radio 4 this morning, <laughs> he was talking about having supplied evidence of the transfer of payments um, from oligarchs through to key people in the UK, including members of the House of Lords. And, you know, you could tell he was almost straining at the bit to tell you <laughs> what it was. Um, are we ever going to get sight of that? And what's to stop him from now revealing that? You know, what's the process, Giles, in terms of people now revealing the evidence they've given? Or is that always going to be held under the, I don't know, you know, Official Secrets Act or something? Um, I, I think James sometimes says that um, it is incumbent upon journalists when they don't know to say, I don't know. Uh, and, and that is the honest truth. I don't know about the status of uh, the evidence given by members to uh, the committee uh, used or not. I do know that certain people who gave evidence to the committee um, have showed it to the tortoise. Um, I'm not gonna say here and now whether uh, for definite, we're going to we're going to come out and uh, uh, publish any of it. Um, uh, I've I've only ever done this sort of work in the states before, actually, where they're much freer and easier, and they have a First Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as we said in the blurb for last week's thinking, we have an unhealthy um, uh, taste for secrecy, and that's why I got a bit shirty on on the friday thinking uh when i realized that they, that in edward lucas's estimation there was likely a uh, really um, granular detail from the intelligence agencies in the classified version of the report that we'll never see um, um but my, my instinct and uh, james and anyone else uh, pitch in is is that um anything that um has been offered as evidence by people summoned to uh, the committee uh, sh should be publishable now. The, the um, can, I, can I tell you the problem I've got here, Charles? And I and I think there's a there's a risk that we're going to look back and we're going to be kind of old and doddery, or older and dodderier in you know thirty years time, and there's going to be sort of the opening of boxes, and we'll be able to look back and see the level of interference and discover that something really pervasive and meaningful happened. Because I think one of the problems with this whole story is that the shrug that accompanies it is the shrug of people that say, look, well, there may have been a little bit of jiggery pokery here and there, but it didn't make any difference to the outcome, right? And that's the fundamental argument around 2016 in the United States. It's the fundamental argument around the Brexit referendum. Uh, you know, people will say the same thing, perhaps with more reason in Scotland because the margins were greater. But, you know, I'm just thinking about this election in Poland. And the Polish election is a really significant one in terms of what the, what the nature of Eastern Europe is in terms of conservatism and liberalism. The margin is just wafer thin. The margin in the US 2016 election was incredibly thin. Actually, Brexit, seriously thin. The, these small interferences could have had a meaningful, possibly even decisive difference. And that's the... That feels like maybe we're sort of knocking on the wrong door here. Maybe we always, I, I see Louise Simpson, you know, saying, you know, follow the money. And that's, that always makes sense to me. I wonder whether we need to follow the money, but also follow the votes, right? And actually go back and start trying to look at some of the patterns of voting. I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm riffing here because no. I, I don't know where we take this, but there is a risk that we're just a little complacent about it. I, I, com I completely agree. Um, and um, uh, 
you, uh, three thoughts occur that um, that that shrug and that sense of powerlessness on the part of the fourth estate is exactly what this government in the UK hopes to elicit at most from us now. Incidentally, um, it, it's what they hope will save them from a proper reckoning of their totally botched handling of COVID-19. Uh, but the other um, two points that I think are worth making is, is that um, on, on this side of the uh, world, that is here and in the US, um, we risk reaching a point where to delve too deeply into these matters of history, where, as you say, the margins were very thin, as a journalist, is to be, is to be seen as obsessive, if not conspiratorial and a yeah. bit nuts, yeah? And, and, and so already, for example, I mean, last year, I spent a lot of time, um, uh, I was going to say on your dime, James, but I think it was actually mine, it's all right, it wasn't a lot of money, uh, actually pursuing what I think probably is a bit conspiratorial, namely the, the, the idea that uh, Russian interference in the US in 2016 was not merely uh, with democratic emails, but was with, with, with voting, with the votes themselves and the vote tallying. Mm -hmm. It's a theory, it's out there, there are people who promote it, um, but, um, uh, and there are some very s smart people who've investigated it, but, but um, that already, um, you feel a little uneasy, like, am, am I wasting my time? But yeah. I think more importantly, the, the last thing I wanted to say was, in Russia, to be associated personally with uh, any um, uh, disclosure, sort of substantial disclosure, of, of, of the, the nitty gritty of meddling is an extremely dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're gonna, we've got, so the way this works is we hold these open news meetings at lunchtime. We then have a kind of trip around the houses with a group of editors saying, okay, what can we do in terms of commissioning people writing, which we'll do this afternoon. So we'll come back to Russia um, uh, later this afternoon. I, I want to hear, there are a few people, Yelena, um, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong, but Sofronievich uh, has got a hand up. Um, William Jeremy, I can see too, and I said I'd come to Alison Stancliffe in a moment. I'm just, Yelena, I'm going to come to you first, but can I just, just want to flag something. I want to just say five minutes for having a discussion about the response to the China reporting, in the sense that it seems to me as though what you're seeing in Xi Jinping's China should be a source of outrage, but it's possible that the response of the West, right, and the US-China rivalry should be a source of alarm too. And so I just wanted to think about the response and what we at Tortoise could or should say on that front, uh, having reported out what's some of the elements of what's happening in Xi Jinping's China. But Yelena, what did you want to bring up? Sorry, I just wanted to go back again to the idea about Northern Ireland. Yes. Um, and I I thought it was interesting, James, that you spoke about this obsession or at least this very detailed knowledge of the intricacies of, for instance, US politics that exists within journalism and how that isn't necessarily reciprocated with Northern Ireland. And I think that that is partially rooted within our education system itself. Um, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently because, for instance, I learned throughout my GCSE and A-levels about the Roaring Twenties in the US twice. Um, I didn't right. once touch on Irish history, which when it is taught is often marginalised or provincialised at least to either the potato famine or the late stages of the Troubles if it's taught. Um, nor did I ever really learn about black history with respect to the UK. I remember in year eight I had a few lessons on what was called the triangular trade and that was it. Um, so really I think that the point that Nico was making linking this to Black Lives Matter is really important because yeah our education curriculum does tend to exclude or limit coverage of Northern Ireland. And I think that fits into the general exclusion of British colonial histories from our national narratives. I totally agree. When Nico was talking, I had one of those light bulb moments where I thought, oh yeah, of course, this thing is definitely going to have a knock on impact on that thing. I mean, you can just see the connect connection. So, so yes, I think that is really worth looking at. There's a whole, um, Giles, my colleague here says that, you know, we should all, um, be sort of uh, barred from the meeting, our, our, our commissioning meeting, when we say we should do a story about so-and-so, 
right? Because stories are stories, you know, you need to find a thread to it. So the thing that's useful is thinking, okay, we've got something on the union here, Northern Ireland, question about Scotland that Andrew's mentioned actually a couple of times. Um, I still trying to work out what's our, what's our story? How are we gonna do, because something very profound seems to be shifting in our understanding of the union in 2020. And it may be staring us in the face. It may be actually the different treatment of COVID. It may be the response to Black Lives Matter and to our history, but we've got to try and f uh, uh, f figure out what that, what that story is. I mean, I'm, Alison Stancliffe, I wanted to come to you because you'd raised the, raised the question about Israel-Palestine. And there's been some really profound, interesting stuff on this front, and we haven't um, got to it given everything else that's going on. But Alison, do you want to weigh in? Hello. Yes. Um, I just want, it's been really um, making me quite anxious that back in June, there was this, to me, extremely shocking sudden announcement, maybe it wasn't so sudden, um, that uh, Netanyahu had said, right, we're going to annex 30% of the West Bank. And there it was in the news, and there it wasn't in the news. And um, I guess what's happened is that in the meantime, um, Netanyahu's um, case has come up again in court, and uh, that's that's the main news. But um, I do think this is something that really is important to us as British people, and we mustn't forget that even though it may be yet another conflict, oh my God, it's been going on for so long and all that, the roots of it are are in our own history. In fact, they're in our own empire history. You know, we're back to the same thing again, not so different in some ways from Northern Ireland. And um, I just wondered why, um, is it when something is as long running as that, uh, that there isn't enough interest? It's, it's exactly what we've been talking about this um, sense of oh had enough of that one there's so many issues around aren't they think about the ones that have come up this morning well, the, well, the, the, i mean the interesting thing about i think israel palestine is generally it's it's had outsized interest so you know you think about it you know you can get attention to israel palestine when maybe you wouldn't about the lord's resistance army or you know northern nigeria or you know i don't know yemen israel palestine historically has had that but you're right in the last you know, a few years, there's been this weariness with the story, partly, I think, because of the domestic politics in Israel, and partly, I suppose, because of the Trump-Netanyahu relationship, the sense that nothing's going anywhere. But the, 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 thing that, the thing that, I don't know whether you saw, Alison, that really interested me, there was a piece by um, a journalist called Peter Beinart in the New York Times last week, which was making the argument for moving on from the two-state solution to a single secular state. And of course it caused, and it's in the New York Times, right? So you can say that uh, the whole Israel-Palestine um, uh, argument is part of our history, but it's not entirely in our hands, uh, not even, I think even a little in our hands. And the fact that it was in the New York Times was really interesting. Uh, and given the new politics in Israel between Netanyahu and Gantz, it suddenly feels like you're right, this is something we should get to. And we we, we talked, front of Giles and I talked, and a few others talked about trying to work out a way of getting back into that story, either traveling through the country or understanding the politics of the Iron Dome. But this is a very good prod. It is a very good prod just to say, we haven't got the answer, but we'll, we, we will come back to it, really we will. Um, the, William, Jeremy, you've got your hand up. Hi there. William, I can't hear you, sorry. They now, like me now, yeah, far away. Yeah, uh, just a quick point that links both China and Russia and maybe the wider story might be coming out of a collective delusion that we might have had in the last 10, 20 years that if we gave the Chinese growing middle class a opportunity for wine, wider world markets and we wined and dined, you know, wealthy Russian oligarchs as well in city institutions, they'd suddenly become signed up 
Democrats and 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 there's this kind of John le Carre style if you expose them to playing by the rules of the British game, suddenly the world will be a better place and the report itself uh, from the ISC does this classic, not naming names, but it's an institutional thing. It's a kind of cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder whether there's something in this losing once more our collective uh, delusion about uh, what the new, in inverted commas, Russia in the 90s and 2000s and the new China in the last 10 years might have produced, as it were. Is there anything in that? I mean, I, I think, look, um, William... Have we been kidding ourselves? Well, well I, so, 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 so oddly... So I find myself on, the, on that old side of the argument. The interesting thing here is I was a reporter in China right. in the late 90s, exactly when that bargain was struck, exactly when the West was seeking to negotiate the terms of Chinese participation in the World Trade Organization, precisely so that China's middle class could benefit from access to world markets, world, the world could benefit from Chinese products and services. And the idea was that a China that was more open to the world would be less repressive at home. The ambition, the hope was that that transition of economic liberalization would lead to political liberalization, that the end point would be democracy. And I don't know whether you, you were part of the thinking, we did one with uh, David Miliband a few months ago, where one of the things that David Miliband said was, having been in China, what was most striking to him was how the party itself was thinking about how to ensure it maintained its one party control of China to 2049, that it was determined to see a century in power. And I suppose this is the this is the issue. This is the issue that I'm sort of struggling with a bit, which is this week, it feels to me as though we're trying to say two things, and we've so far said one. We've got one thing to say, which is look in detail at the nature of this repressive regime. You know, as Giles sort of sets out, this is a network of informants and AI apparatus. We've never seen totalitarianism at this scale or sophistication, right? That's not to say that, that there haven't been worse regimes that have committed greater acts of cruelty. It's just, the, it's just modern authoritarianism and how it works. So I feel as though in the reporting that Giles does, that you'll see during the course of the week, Min Xin Pei, Wang Yang Cho, these people have done for us, you'll see that. There's a second question though, which is what's the right response to it? And that's where I feel that we're trying to work out and we're gonna run out of time on this today, but that's where I feel is the next piece of work for us is to work out how does Tortoise articulate a point of view that says, you know, the weaponization of business, let's say Huawei or TikTok, or, you know, the, 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 the particular politicization of certain people without thinking through what the retribution will be. I've been really alarmed to see this concern that Chinese students have on campuses in the UK about the way they're perceived. It's really, you know, that's not the way things should be going. And so I suppose the question for us is how do you do the two parts of the story, the story of what's happening in China and then what a sensible, constructive, impactful response will be um, but unfortunately we're out of time so we're gonna that's one of those questions that's that's left hanging um Liz, can i just say a, a huge thank you to everyone for uh joining us uh, he, here's what i've noted down gaming i'm going to pick up with pete hoskin i hope he's picked up with umar and um jack and andrew and uh yasmin and others so we'll see what we can do on that front i feel as though we've sort of been giving our given our marching orders on russia which is uh that i had an old editor when i was at the ft who when you filed a very long piece of copy that was more or less unreadable said yes yes it's all there so this comes under the heading of yes yes it's all there we've got a lot of words we just don't yet know what the story is so we'll we have to come back to that 
On this subject about Northern Ireland and Scotland, this has come up a fair few weeks, and we, we're going to look, aren't we, Charles, on, on Friday at Scotland in particular. The Sense Makers special is on, is on Scotland, and so please do join us. It will be a jumping off point um, for talking about the Union uh, too. Um, we'll come back to thinking about a take on, uh, on China, but I pick up in particular the point about coming back um, to, to Israel um, uh, and, and having to think about how we touch on that too. So um, I know there's much more to talk about. Thank you for joining us. The, one of the themes we're doing over the next couple of days, by the way, is just what's happening in the UK economy. We didn't do it today uh, at lunchtime because we've got a real chance to dig in. We're trying to do macro and micro. So tonight we're going to do, is it the end of the pub? Is the pub going to become equivalent to the greengrocer? It'll exist, but it's a sort of, you know, like a sort of tea room, a kind of cultural nicety rather than a part of the fabric of every community. And then tomorrow we're going to do a real look at what are we going to do about mass unemployment, particularly around young people, and how, sh how, how can uh, we respond to that. So please join us for those. But for today, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, everyone. See you later.